Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live in sync with your cycle? Do you struggle with a negative mindset around your period? Are you wondering if it's possible to be feminist and anti-birth control? We're going to explore these questions and so much more in the Managing Your Fertility podcast, because this is about helping you live a whole and full life. I'm your host and guide, Bridget Busacker, joining you in this journey of exploration related to women's health care, feminism, and fertility awareness. Are you ready? Let's get started. Alex, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you on. Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm pumped. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce our guest, Alex Rose. She is a family nurse practitioner and fertility care practitioner turned stay-at-home mom, homeschooling her four awesome boys. She's passionate about empowering women with knowledge of fertility awareness, joyful encouragement, and the dignity of motherhood, which is so fantastic. Alex, like, tell us about your story and just like everything that is encompassed here in your intro. You're a family nurse practitioner, fertility care practitioner. You're encouraging women in the space of Instagram and on your blog and your business. Like, tell us more about who you are and your passion for women. Oh, thank you, Bridget. I'm so honored to be here. I I just love everything about managing your fertility. I know we'll get into it. Um, But yes, so I am um, been married to Nick for 10 years. I'm actually a cradle Catholic. We met on Catholic match uh, 11 years ago, actually, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, and, um, when we met, I was just graduating nursing school and, um, I worked in an intensive care unit for a couple of years and through that experience, um, decided to go back to graduate school and kind of saw some just really, uh, just really, really the sickest of the sick when I was working in, in the ICU and just really how, Um, yeah, just very many comorbidities and all of that. And so my, my intention of going for my master's to become a a family nurse practitioner was so that I could kind of prevent some of these really, really comorbid diseases. And I thought if I could get patients, um, before they hit this intensive care unit, you know, more of preventative medicine, Um, when they're sitting next to me in the office and, um, you know, we're talking about lifestyle, I thought that was kind of my drive. So that was my whole desire of, of working more with families out, out of the office. And as I was going through graduate school, I was, like I said, I was a cradle Catholic. So I was kind of formed by this backdrop of always, um, really being strong in my faith actually. And also I'm the oldest of eight children. I should tell you that. And so um, being pro-life was kind of part of my story as well, just growing up in, a, a, you know, a big Catholic family. <laughs> so as I was going through um, grad school and um, with my intention of, you know, helping people prevent disease and wellness, um, I was really, I started to become just really shocked at how kind of the, the culture of death was in the education system in my master's program. And um so that was kind of like the leading spot of like this fire that was within me, um, you know, to kind of, kind of, okay, I'm going off track, but really this fire that was within me to, um, understand why there was such a, a lack of education and a lack of awareness to women specifically within women's health, um, out there. And I couldn't really understand why, from I'll backtrack a little bit from when, when I was in college and all of my friends were getting, I'm getting right into it, Bridget. (laughs) And all of my friends were kind of the background we need. This is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so really, you know, when I was in college and all of my friends were, you know, on the birth control pill truly. And, you know, and I also went to a Catholic college, university of Scranton. Um, and I, that was never a temptation of mine personally, but, um, and, and, you know, and I also was never, um, facing women's health disease at a young age where, you know, that would have been a, something that maybe a doctor would have decided to prescribe. So that being said, you know, seeing this in the college atmosphere and just how many women were, you know, on birth control. And <laughs> I was kind of shocked at this. Um, once I got through graduate school, I really started to understand it more. And the pieces were all kind of put together of, okay, a, a lot of these women, they don't have the knowledge or the awareness and they're kind of they're kind of just doing, you know, what they're maybe told to do without any further knowledge or awareness. So, so that being said, I'm this, you know, new nurse practitioner in, in this graduate program. Um, I'm also married with my oldest at the time. So I'm also a new mother. And, um, and as I'm seeing patients, um, I, I'm realizing, you know, that 
prescribing birth control and going in this route is something that I'm not going to do for many other reasons, but I just was searching and I was searching for other answers, just like kind of how you were when you, you know, founded your business managing fertility, right? Like I've heard your story before. And so that's kind of where I was too. I was searching for, you know, there has to be something else out there and there has to be people who think the way that I'm thinking. And so through my search is kind of how I came to find Napper technology and, um, you know, all of the, um, amazing pro-life medicine that was out there and, um, led me on a whole other journey after that. (laughs) That's so great. I think what you said too, just with being in grad school and seeing, a, a lack of understanding for women's health. I mean, that's exactly what I found in my graduate program. Yes. It's just seeing that women were not informed. I mean, I was doing a lot of coursework in women's health and trying to tailor it to that with mm-hmm. women's health communication and just seeing that, you know, women really, we weren't having these conversations around women's health in a holistic way. I mean, we were talking about, you know, aspects of women's health, but it was very fragmented. And there wasn't this underlying holistic sense of, okay, well, how does my body work? What does that mean? How does that impact who I am and, and what I'm doing and other arenas of my health? It was like, we were doing this top down approach when it was like, okay, foundationally we're missing the, the groundwork we need. Mm-hmm. And, and Absolutely. That lack, it's like, okay, what, what the heck is going on? So when did you start realizing women's healthcare really wasn't for women. Was that in grad school or were you starting to see that in college or even, even before that, where you were just like, puzzles weren't, they weren't matching. They were not lining up. Yeah, I know. I'm so glad you said that you asked that question. So I think it was, you know, and I should have, I should have said this earlier, but I think starting back with college, um, was the first experience where I kind of had this little taste of, um, empowerment for women where they could kind of make their own decisions. Um, and w- with my friends that I ended up convincing them to go off the, off of the pill. And um, what I kind of saw from those experiences was that there was a lack, there was this breakdown barrier between, you know, them and, you know, and I love, I love healthcare and I love doctors, but there was this barrier between them where I would ask my friends, you know, well, do you, have you talked to your doctor about other options? You know, have you, um, you know, they were, they were depressed, Bridget, they were, um, and some of them weren't even sexually active. They didn't know why they were on the pill. They were just on the pill. And, um, because I was in a nursing major, they would talk to me about their health. And so we would get into these conversations and, um, and I would just talk about, well, do you think maybe the birth control pill could be a, a cor- culprit of any of your symptoms, you know, and they would just say, well, well, no, why? I don't think so. You know? And I was kind of that first like bug in their ear of, well, let's, let's talk about maybe that that's, a, that's a possibility. And, um, they would came, come back from spring break. And this happened multiple times with multiple friends. And they were like, I stopped taking the pill and I feel so much better. And so that was the first like break in the crack of, okay, you know, they're not, they're not, these women aren't, aren't even questioning it at all. They're not even like thinking about questioning it. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a lack of education there. And so that was in college. And then, um, like I said, through, through grad school (laughs) here, I was as a new wife and a new mom, um, practicing NFP in my marriage, like, you know, never even thinking about going on the pill or anything like that personally. Um, and studying, studying family nurse practitioner would get to the women's health section and it's literally use the pill, use the pill. Everything is, everything is, you know, this, this approach of, you know, not getting to the, to basically like the root cause of anything, (laughs) or, you know, it just is, it's, it's kind of straight. This is our, this is how we treat every disease in women's health. And I'm really not, not being, I'm really not being sarcastic. Like that's really what it was. And I was just, my jaw was just dropping, you know, and I was just, I remember like raising my hand, like, are we going to talk about, you know, anything natural or any fertility, fertility approaches or anything. And there'd be like one little paragraph in one chapter of that. And that was it. Um, and so <laughs> that was kind of like you, you said the question of, you know, where did you notice a break drop? Like that, that was definitely it. And that just really fueled my fire. And so I was just ready to, to find all the research that I could. And I remember even, you know, mentioning like Napa technology and it was just really not taken in a well, it wasn't accepted well through the grad program, which I completely understand, you know, as <laughs> being a student and not a professor. But the interesting thing is I decided to do my thesis on the correlation between birth control and abortion. Um, 
uh, breast cancer, I'm sorry, the correlation between um, taking birth control and causing causation of breast cancer, which we know that there's a lot of research that has a positive correlation with that. Same thing as when a women who have abortions are at a higher chance for breast cancer um, because of what the, the different cells that happen um, through the abortion process. So I decided to do my research paper on that. And my professor at the time, she was very pro-abortion. Um, she, when I was talking about this, she said, maybe you should go to Planned Parenthood and um, do some of, you know, interview some, some of them <laughs> to try to get more information. And I was just kind of laughing, like, this is, this is actually the opposite of that. Um, and so through that, I ended up doing um, um, a really well, well-written research process on paper and thesis. And the professor actually like nominated the thesis for an award and she, she was really interested. Um, so I, I share that just to say that there, there's, there was hidden research there, but it was not, it was not the most well accepted and it wasn't the, or I should say it wasn't the most popular. That's incredible. I mean, and just, I'm, I'm just like, wow. Okay. Here's this professor who's just really un- unclear of, of what's available and even the research coming out. I mean, you would think when you're, when you're in the space of nurse practitioner and you're getting your master's and we're going to be talking about women's health, that there would be some, I don't know, knowledge there that it wouldn't just be a couple paragraphs. And so right. then that it's just like, oh, it's like one or two, and then we're going to be done with that. I mean, really there's what other medication exists where we don't talk about side effects and if nothing right. else, we actually brush it off. I mean, you're mm-hmm. talking about exactly. a functioning system for the most part. And individuals may say, okay, well, I have painful periods. I have endo, I have PCOS or I have hormonal acne. So, you know, it's presented as this will, will clear this up. Um, but really, I mean, this is not getting at the heart of any issues foundationally. I mean, this is taking a functioning system and saying, turn it off. Because exactly that's what it does. So even if you are in pain, it's not actually addressing the pain. And there's so much research behind what we're talking about right now that I'm that I can link to. In fact, is a great resource for that. It's intended for medical yes. professionals. But mm-hmm. I think it's worthwhile if someone's interested in and in seeing more of the research available and seeing what is going on from an educational perspective to try and educate in these spaces to say, look, here's all of the extensive research available let's start to (laughs) expand this so that we're not just having three paragraphs in textbook and saying, this is the response. This is the answer. Right. Exactly. It's not actually helping women in their health. And I, and I mean, too, from, from your professor's standpoint, the fact that she nominated your paper and was really interested in the work you're doing just shows the, the lack of understanding that exists Mm -hmm. across the board in the medical field for exactly roles and for providers that just aren't receiving additional information and training to at least question. I mean, I think that exactly. blows my mind. I remember that with a professor in one of my women's health courses, when at the end of the, the course, you, you pitched um, like a, it was like a two page flyer, like front and back around a particular issue related to women's health and provided research and really as an educational piece. And someone had done natural family planning. I chose uh, PCOS to talk more specifically about that and treatment plan. And in the practice of doing that, the professor didn't even seem to, she she wasn't even bothered by it. She was almost like, oh, wow, interesting. And I was like, mm-hmm. what? And I had women in the class who were like, oh, wait, so like, this isn't the rhythm method. It's, there's a, there's, there are options. I mean, it was like, I really thought I was going to be seeing in my program a lot more pushback, but I found there was almost a like, yeah, like, okay, this is a new generation of women or something who are just like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't even know what this is. What is this? Mm-hmm. Um, I love that you're saying that. No, I love that you're saying that. And I think that like for people listening, that's so important to hear that because there is that like aha moment where people are, are so interested. And that's kind of what you and I are both passionate about of that, in, that, that empowerment piece. And like, I think that that's what we're both saying is that when, when, when women are, once they become aware, that's why I love this fertility awareness. Once they become aware of it, most of the time women are, are actually, they're not even going to, they're not even going to choose the pill. <laughs> and that's what I have, have found. And same thing for, you know, these professors, like once they're given another option, um, especially women, they, they, they tend to choose what's best for them anyway, on the, on their own, basically on their own. Yeah, and, exactly. um, you know, it's, it's so true. And so it's really, you know, there's that, just that missing piece where it comes into the lack of education. And I think when people understand 
um, a lot of times people, women can have this almost like righteous anger that comes out when say that they've never been, they one when they've never been told what their other options were. Mm-hmm. And sometimes rightly so, you know, that there's this like righteous anger. Well, why wasn't it? And I think it's just, it's just helpful to hear our stories, understanding that it really starts with the education system. So that's something that, you know, we're not going to fix on our own, an entire medical system. That's unfortunately a lot of, a lot of, you know, in the women's health section, it's, it's really lucrative. And so a lot of it is, can be founded. I want to be so harsh, but it can be a little bit founded on the culture of death in terms of being pro-abortion, pro-contraceptive. Um, so when we understand that this is why there's a lack of awareness, because it's coming from, you know, the education systems, it's coming from the medical schools, the graduate programs, they're not being taught. So a lot of these doctors have zero knowledge. And you and I both, you know, you and I both know that, you know, the, 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 so, you know, um, when we, when we understand that it kind of takes away, okay. So, you know, it puts it back on, on the patient, on us to become aware ourselves. And the good news is that there's so much more available. I feel like now than there was even 10 years ago, right. Would you, you would probably agree with that too. There's so much more, like you mentioned facts and all these other organizations and, um, And I I want to go back to what you said of just that like aha moment, like what your professor said, where I've seen that with women, when you, when you present them with this, these options of, wow, there's pro-life medicine out there. There's, you know, NAPRO technology or um, fertility awareness. They are, they're so excited to learn more. And they're like, oh my gosh, this, these options are available to me. Like, tell me more about that. And I remember having patients when I was practicing as a nurse practitioner and they, I would say, you know, okay, well, I don't, I'm not going to prescribe the pill. Um, sometimes just not even explaining why just saying, let's look at other options. Are you interested in other options? And they're like, I didn't know that there was other options, Mm -hmm. you know, like, tell me, tell me, tell me what these other options are. Well, and that's, I think the, the irony of, of all of this is that we talk about women having options in healthcare, and yet we don't offer options, you know, exactly. doctors are trained to offer options. And so exactly. you're really, it's really, you're presented with, okay, well, you can be on the pill or not on the pill. It's like, well, that's, those aren't options. <laughs> exactly. Know, that's, that's exactly. So Bridget. Exactly. And I don't know if we really wanted to chat about that, but you're so right, because that's kind of where it comes down to this, you know, debunking of, of terms like pro-choice. Well, being pro-choice, we're pro-choice in the sense of uh, give us the choices, you know? Um, so sometimes that term is kind of stolen and like twisted into meaning something else. I totally agree. And that's exactly where my, my head goes with that. Because if, if we're really wanting to promote a culture of options for women, we would offer every opportunity to say, okay, here are all the different ways that you can, you know, not only understand your health, plan your family, make decisions for care by mm-hmm. with your healthcare provider. I mean, I think that's something that is totally lacking from the conversation. We've separated it because this has become such a taboo topic to get into because it's like, oof, if I start dismantling or questioning what's available to women right now, or what's lauded as the best type of healthcare available, I'm not feminist. I am anti-woman. Where I think mm-hmm. the irony and all of that is like, how much more anti-woman can you get to tell a woman you have only one option? It's to shut down your functioning system. It will not yeah. stop from illnesses because yeah. at that point you decide, I do want to get married and have a family or I do want to start having children. And you've been taking the, the pill for, you know, treating pain or underlying health conditions. You're back to square one. You know, Absolutely. You have to go and start doing the work that you could have been doing earlier. And that's not to blame women. You know, I don't, I'm not in the space of saying, okay, well, it's your fault. No, it's not. Unfortunately, this is right. a crap system that we've, we have participated in. And now it's our opportunity to change it. Because I think like what you said earlier, you know, it's the decision-making is put back on us, which is not a bad thing. You know, we're, mm-hmm. we can't just demand and rely on doctors to make those changes or professors to make those changes because there's already such a limited opportunity for resources and information for them. And I know with Dr. Marguerite Dwayne, the founder of Facts, she's talked about, you know, a lot of the doctors that are taking her coursework and expanding their knowledge in the OBGYN um, system and understanding more holistic care for women or just at least educating themselves so they can provide their patients with options. They're having to do that coursework in addition to absolutely so this right. Is absolutely. Something integrated. So, I mean, there is this both and dance of, yes, we need to ask our doctors for more. We need to recommend 
facts to them if they're if they're questioning what we're doing or at least mm-hmm. they like check this out but also there's the element of educating ourselves and we do have to be boots on the ground and working toward this and it and we may not see it in our lifetime but if it can be for our kids or our grandkids like that's reward enough and I think just mm-hmm. getting back into that that headspace to really think about that mm-hmm. oh my gosh absolutely no it's so true I I, I think even like I, I do think it's it's coming you know, you, with technology and, you know, within the last decade, I would say, you know, we're kind of opening that conversation of, like you said, the tabooness of birth control. And there's, there's a huge, there's a lot, a, a big movement, I think, you know, you had like sweetening of the pill. Um, that's a great resource. Um, it's the book subverted. I know, I think, I think, have, have you read that Bridget? I think if we talked about that, but I that, um, that one, that's, oh my gosh, I would recommend that to listeners as well. It's, um, kind of like talking about, um, the, the feminist movement, how it was kind of hijacked by the sexual revolution. And the author of that book, she had like worked for Cosmopolitan and all of this when kind of the whole sexual revolution came out and we were talking about, you know, that that whole feminist movement. And she really debunks that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, I think women in our generation who are of that mindset, more like fertility awareness and what are our other options, you know, and we don't just want to be we don't just want to have this one option of birth control. Yeah. And I think, I, yeah, yeah, I think that there's a lot of hope there for sure. Um, but, but like you said, in terms of, you know, understanding why, um, why, why, why there's a, why it's hard, (laughs) why it can be a little bit harder in the beginning. Um, you know, it kind of in the education system, the kind of that there's that answer of, you know, where it comes down to almost like a financial, um, piece of it, where in medicine, you know, these doctors, like Dr. Dwayne, these, these doctors and technology doctors who are choosing the pro-life route, you know, they're not, they're not going to be having all these accolades of pharmaceutical drugs. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's tougher in that sense. So you can understand, you know, OBGYNs who are promoting IVF and these other pharmaceuticals like birth control, they're going to be rewarded in the system, not not by physicians who are doing, you know, facts and app technology. So it's a lot harder for them. Um, but I think that that's, it's, it's just to acknowledge that that's okay because that just lets us know, okay, you know, we're going to be doing something that is not, you know, not the most popular, (laughs) but like maybe the best for our health. Right. And isn't that so funny too? I mean, the irony in that is just like, okay, it's not popular, you know, through standards of teaching and, um, you know, different outreach that's done, you know, just, just through education with patients. And yet it, it usually, (laughs) it usually is the most well-received by a patient who wants answers. You know, it actually sounds like the most popular option because it's like, oh, this, this option gives me options. It gives me choices. It gives me opportunity to learn my body and have a more, a healthy understanding of, of who I am and how I function. And I think the beauty of, you know, not only having, I think, social media and the opportunity to search and to be able to find accounts and find people's stories, but also I think this movement towards integrative health and a desire to talk more openly about therapy, about nutrition, about clean products, about clean living, about getting better sleep and just these conversations, you know, it's, there isn't a lot of at least from what I'm seeing online with a lot of accounts that are popular, you know, there isn't a shaming around that. It's all around education and just saying, have we thought about this? And I think how beautifully fertility awareness also fits into that where, you know, yes. Okay. We're eating organic eggs and we're using clean soap and we're eliminating, you know, different environmental toxins for our health. And then that, then you get to that point, you're like, okay, so what about your fertility? And that's where I think individuals kind of have that moment, like, what about it? It's like, well, Mm -hmm. you can do something in that space too. And how beautiful it is that we're seeing, I think, greater acceptance of just self-awareness and the desire that individuals have to say, oh, I want to be really in tune with my body. I want to know what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking, like feeling and dealing. Like I want to be in this space of acknowledgement and not just sitting in darkness about what's going on. You know, I think we've just seen too many Mm -hmm. stories that have that underlying you know, I guess outlook, you know, where it's like, okay, I was stuck for so long. And then I finally figured something out and I don't want to leave, have somebody else in that same space. And so I think that's really the beauty of storytelling. There can be some downsides to that, of course, in any scenario, but 
I want to get into this a little bit more and just expanding our scope of feminism because we're kind of throwing out words like, okay, feminist, not feminist, and yeah. pro-woman, pro-life, pro-choice. So I think, you know, from your perspective, how does the pro-life movement, because I think some people hearing this are going to be like, ew, what? The pro-life movement, how is that supposed to tie into fertility awareness? Um, how does that tie into fertility awareness and just a more holistic approach to our understanding of our health? And our life. Oh my goodness. Oh yes. No, I, 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 I totally love this topic. Um, because it, it, it really does. I mean, like you said, when women, once they become aware of these other options and that, you know, they're not having to put something in their body <laughs> to fix something, um, they're not having to, um, to kill really the, the, the natural function, even if it's not like a, um, even if we're not talking about, you know, like a plan B or an abortification, which birth control still can be an abortification. Um, but the whole, the whole premises and the whole mechanism of action of specifically, you know, birth control, um, is to kill, you know, part of the woman's naturally occurring cycle, you know, to, like you said, suppress, shut it down. So it's kind of just this whole not pro-life, um, approach to, treating a, any women's health option, you know, like a, a, um, a way of treating medicine, you know, in a restorative sense or in a way of, um, getting to the underlying cause, you know, trying to, um, be, um, helping to restore a woman's function to what she's, it's naturally built to do, which is what we do. Like you said earlier in every other area of medicine, um, you know, if your heart's not working, we don't try to shut down your heart. You know, we try to restore the heart to the normal function, you know? So in women's health, if your ovaries aren't working properly or, you know, your, um, endometrial lining isn't working properly, you know, in, instead of just shutting it down, which is what the pill does, <laughs> the, the pro, um, pro-life option is to restore the, to the naturally occurring function. So, um, really the, the, the biggest option in terms of actually treating women's health issues is natural procreative technology, which is NAPRO. And that's really going to be any woman's pro-life option of getting treatment in women's health. That's not going to be this anti-life shutdown, you know, contraceptive mentality. Um, so the reason that you know, fertility awareness is pro-life. And the reason that, you know, taking the pill and all this really isn't, it's just, it's just the sense of, if you kind of think of your body as a living, you know, living organism, you know, and like I, like that example of the heart, I mean, in any other area of medicine, we're not, we're not killing, we're not killing part of your body. We're always trying to restore it to its normal function. That's such a great answer. I love that. And just the example that you give, you know, you're not trying to shut somebody's heart down when they have issues with their heart or (laughs) clogged arteries. Right, right, right. How do we make this better? How do we improve your, your life, your health expectancy, like uh, life expectancy, your, your overall health and how you're doing and where you want to see that trajectory go. Um, And I think that's something just for women to, to think on and reflect on, you know, in your healthcare experience, you know, do you find that you're being met with an understanding, especially related to your fertility, where you feel like you're thriving, you're not surviving that your, your body is functioning well, and you're not finding that you, you know, you're not putting up with symptoms that you shouldn't be putting up with. The Atlantic had a piece a couple years ago that was essentially like an expose and, and other, other media outlets, um, some picked them, some picked it up, some didn't, but they really talked about the the male hormonal contraception issue. And I know Alex, we've talked about, you know, men were given the opportunity to take hormonal contraceptives and just to see how they responded and they hated it. They found that they couldn't handle the mood swings and the fluctuations in hormones and just the, the brain fog they were feeling. And so the outcome of that study was that, you know what, this isn't safe to continue. Um, women have been doing this and tolerating it. So let's just keep it to that. They probably are more, basically they're more hormonal and deal with hormonal fluctuations. They can handle it. And men just don't want to deal with this because they can't function this way in their life, in work Mm -hmm. and in personal, Mm -hmm. like what a slap in the face to women, because what does that say? Okay. So, um, we're working towards healthy functioning bodies and systems for men. So we're not going to shut down their body and they're always Mm -hmm. fertile, by the way always fertile. Let's just keep that mm-hmm. in mind. <laughs> right. 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 And we're saying, okay, you know what, women, you put up with a lot. 
and your body is kind of, it's almost like saying you're kind of crazy anyway. So we're just going to let you ride this train Mm -hmm. and we're, we'll look at this maybe at a later date. And I remember talking with different individuals who I know who are, you know, either indifferent to hormonal contraceptives or pro contraceptive, um, anti-contraceptive. And they were all enraged by this article thinking like, how dare these researchers, how dare these men, how dare, and then it, but then it started to crumble. It was like, wait, what, this is such an, an attack and an affront to, to me, to my dignity, to me as a woman mm-hmm. to say, I just get to put up with this, to having headaches, to feeling brain fog, to dealing with depression, to dealing with low libido. Like we have to be honest about the, the um, side effects of birth control. And absolutely talk about it because when you, when you list off all the different things that are going to be essentially, you know, downplayed, taken away from you, limited in your experience, your everyday experience, it's awful. And to talk about the feminist movement, how obsessive it can be around sex and sexual freedom and the idea that, okay, you don't have to have kids. You can have sex with whoever you want. Your libido isn't, is down on hormonal contraceptives. This mm-hmm. is a huge side effect. It's listed on your medication. It's a part mm-hmm. it's a part of it. If you listen to the ad of the smiling woman living her best life and you hear the, the woman talking really fast to give all, all of the different ways in which it's you're going to hate <laughs> your life, like that's one of them. You're not going to enjoy sex. Mm-hmm. That's like totally the opposite of what this movement is trying to produce. And I'm not, I'm not saying every feminist... Is, is living out this way. Everyone who identifies as a feminist is pushing towards that. But that's a reality that is oftentimes very much pushed in the realm of contraception and why it was introduced, frankly. And so to have this, just these, these mixed messages and ultimately to say, you know, women don't, women don't need better healthcare. You know what you've been dealing mm-hmm. with for this long. Let's just leave it because this is going to get messy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that story I know took off and then it kind of died out because it really wasn't taken up by other individuals. I mean, it wasn't taken up by Planned Parenthood. It wasn't taken up by other organizations outside of like holistic women's healthcare. Oh, absolutely. Look at this, see this, like recognize, like Mm -hmm. this is not for you. It's against you. Absolutely. Yeah. Anytime that there, anytime that there comes any kind of skeptical, you know, (laughs) skepticism of, um, you know, birth control in the mainstream medicine, it's just going to be, it's going to be completely hidden. You know, that was kind of like going back to even like my thesis, that's, you know, any kind of correlation between birth control and, um, and breast cancer was completely hidden because the pharmaceutical companies, the whole industry, they don't want that out there because it would hurt their business, you know? Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, birth control is listed as a group one carcinogen. So group one carcinogen, that's in the same category as tobacco. Like that's, that's crazy, you know, yeah, and wi- women, you know I mean? I think women <laughs> yeah, like, who are listening, like this isn't fake news. This isn't something that we, right, we, right. We yes. It's a butt. group one carcinogen. Like this is, this, this is, is in the research. very toxic. Like, you pulled yeah. this and your professor who was not on board with your paper gave you like, you know, what did you say? They, she, you know, right. Right. Oh yeah. She wanted as, to, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, right. Right. This is, this is real. And we'll, we can link to the research and, and we can link, I'll link as well to the Atlantic article, because I think it's just important to read, even if you don't agree with it, having that growth mindset to say, okay. And, and, and asking yourself questions to say like, what are the messages I've been told? What am oh, I absolutely. How do I, you know, if I'm not on hormonal contraception or I am, you know, how do I feel? What's going on with this? How does this make me mm-hmm. feel as an individual, as a woman? Do I feel absolutely fear? like, these yeah, are absolutely. Things that I think we need to get us. Yes. So we're throwing around feminism a lot, but JP2 talks about a new feminism and really it's a, it's a call to a more holistic approach and living out the feminine genius and living out um, the beauty of who we are as women. And I, that can sound fluffy and, and we're not going to get into an extensive overview of the, of JP2's letter to women and just his work in theology of the body. I can link to those, to those sources again for um, additional digging, but I think it really speaks to a much more, as I said earlier, holistic approach. And as you've identified that, that we need. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess from your perspective and in the work that you've done, what is, what does it look like for a woman to live out new feminism in the context of her health? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I, it's the word that I, that I always use is I, I always will say this is just the empowerment of knowledge because, um, you know, most of the time when, when women in their health, like going back to our whole conversation, they're not presented with all the options. 
back to like my friends that I was talking with in college, they, they, you know, they were just, I want to say almost blindly taking the pill and, um, they didn't, they didn't, weren't aware that they had other options. So that's not empowerment. That's not, you know, being a feminist in any sense of the word, you know, um, having power over your body, having power over your choices, um, which that's something that's a Christian, you know, God, God's the ultimate creator of, he gives us the choice. So, um, so it starts with, with that, even back in college. And like I said, even through, um, through working with patients in my early, um, uh, early, uh, profession, you know, with seeing women in the office and them just feeling these horrible side effects or, um, or horrible, you know, um, kind of like victim mindset. We talk about mindset, like almost like that playing that victim of, you know, this is, this is all that I can be doing is taking this pill. Once they were presented with the option through a pro-life provider, they were more empowered and they were more able to make their own choice. It's not that we're forcing them to choose. We're always leaving it up to the woman to choose. That's, that's true, you know, true feminism, you know, really like, you know, the woman being empowered with knowledge and, um, and, and then ultimately that will lead to kind of like a love for who she's created to be. And that's kind of like on a deeper theological note, but, um, but just kind of in a broader sense, you know, Bridget of just having women feel like they're empowered that, that word empowerment really ties into the feminist, um, movement and, um, and that's the, you know, they, 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 they have it backwards, you know, like women who are, are thinking of a feminist in the sense of not what JP2 is talking about, you know, thinking of a feminist as kind of a pro-abortion, um, pro-contraception, um, because number one, most of the time they don't know, they don't have the full scope of knowledge of really what, what is abortion doing to the woman's body? What does the birth control pill do to the woman's body? Which is what you and I have just ta- talked about, um, you know, and also, um, what are their other options? So it's kind of, you know, this whole idea, um, like you said, you know, JP two more of, on the actual theological end of it is absolutely beautiful, but just from a very foundational level of, you know, holistic women's healthcare. Um, I think that a woman listening to this can, can walk away. And if she's never thought of it in that light before, it's really like a light bulb moment. You know, like when you talk to a woman who maybe she's been on the pill for a long time, or she has friends on the pill, you know, um, if we, think of the, if we think of feminism in the light of empowerment with knowledge, so we kind of can start from that groundwork. And in that way she can, it almost turns the mindset of, okay, let me actually love my body and not try to kind of suppress it or have to kill it. Um, but you can't really get there unless you first have that, that first have that foundational awareness, which is what the work you're doing with fertility awareness, like just the awareness of what are my options and what is this really doing? And then most of the time women are smart we're, we're smarter than men, right? (laughs) That's what feminists would think, right? Like we, so most of the time women are very smart. And when they're presented with this knowledge, they are just like eating it up and they're like, okay, wow, I don't have to be taking this pill. That's amazing. Tell me what else I can do. You know, and they're, they're smart. They're going to, they're going to find the apps they need. They're going to find the um, doctors that they need. And that's, uh, that's been honest to God, my experience um, with women. That's great. And I love that you're including the practicals like, of like, what, what can someone do or where can they start if, if they're finding that I think this traditional sense of feminism is starting to fall away and you're saying, you know what, this isn't, this isn't what I'm, this is what, this isn't working for me. I'm not cut out for this. This, this doesn't make sense anymore. I know uh, Leah Jacobson, founder of the Guiding Star Project, when we've chatted, you know, she said, she talks about this new wave coming in of this new feminism because women are so tired of, of what's being currently given to them, fed to them. And just the ideology that's really presented that really cuts us apart and, and has us living disintegrated lives when it's, it's really saying, okay, you know, first and foremost, like you said, let's start with the knowledge. Let's be given the options. Let's see what's, yes. This isn't about yes. Shoving da- things down your throat or saying you're living out your life wrong. You're a bad woman. Absolutely not. Absolutely you know, not. Right. Living right now where you are in this moment, like that's where you are. This is part of, yes. Your but it's, yes, it's, I think I shouldn't say, but it's, and we're saying, okay, let's have a growth mindset instead of the scarcity mindset and saying, this is dumb. This is wrong. This is silly, you know, and, and instead saying, okay, what can I learn from this? What am I mm-hmm. doing right now? Like, what would I like to see in my life and give yourself the permission to dream of a better life, you know, dream of better healthcare, dream of feeling absolutely. Better. Yes. Get to that core of what you want, those core of the desire. And again, I, I love this, that 
the the foundation of the word desire, the etymology really means um, desire from Latin meaning desire of the father. So really it's like of the father's heart, you know, like what is that that's placed in your heart from God, the father to say like, what is it that you desire? What are you made mm-hmm. for? What is that, that deeper pull that you're saying, man, I, I want to feel really good. I want to be healthier. I want out of a toxic relationship. I want out of, you know, obsessive eating, whatever it is, it's related to your health. And, and just thinking more broadly, and I know we're focused on fertility awareness, but this can go in other arenas and really just saying, okay, what does it mean for me to live out a new feminism? Because absolutely so refreshing. And to me, that's just like so refreshing. And when I learned that term, my mom actually had heard like a cat, like with the Catholic feminist and, and Claire's work and just hearing this term, the new feminist that I was talking more about, she got me a ring that, that says feminist on it. And she says, I'm getting this for you. I know it doesn't say new feminist, but it's because you're going to usher in new feminism. And so I want you. Oh, to that's awesome. And I just like, and it was just like little, this little token when I was doing, I did my first podcast with Claire and I love it. I have it as one of my rings because I always look to that and think of my mom saying like, let's usher in a new feminism. Let's like, yes, take, let's that's beautiful. That. And I just, oh, I love like it. It's that. so beautiful. Yeah, it really is. Yes, like, like, that's we, so beautiful. How do we expand on this? You know, I think, mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's argument to say, should we obliterate the term feminism? Should we get rid of it? Is it not serving anyone? And I think like, well, there are good aspects to it. We don't know yet because we, right. we are just starting, I mean, J, JP2 had such beautiful writings that are really coming to, um, I think, fruition now. I mean, we're seeing it and hearing about theology of the body so much more. We're having these conversations around what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be fully alive as an individual? Absolutely. That look like? And so I think in this space, you know, there's so much more exploration that can be done that we, we don't need to be afraid of it or scoff at it. Let's come at it with openness and say, what is this? How do Absolutely. I what could oh, I, I think so too. It? And I think absolutely you disagree with it. It's like, okay, that's okay. Why are you disagreeing? Get at the root instead of just saying cancel or block or I'm never, you know, unfollow. Like what's, what's going on that it's stirring in your heart, even just hearing this podcast and going, okay, this is really challenging me. I disagree with 80% of what you're saying, but, or, you know, 99% of what you're saying, but that 1% of me is saying, what is that? Because whatever that I want more. And if you feel that tug Mm -hmm. in your heart of, I want more, go after it because it's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I mean, talk about like the root word, you know, mentioning the root word of desire. It's like, well, what's the root word of feminism, like femininity, like we're feminine, we're female, you know? And um, (laughs) so I think it's good to explore, you know, what, how we feel about that and, and, you know, just being confident and being female because, you know, Lord knows that that, that word is also under attack. Yeah, exactly. So, (laughs) so (laughs) it's it's like, there's so many layers here and we're just, this episode is really getting at like, let's, let's start, let's get at this foundational work. There's yes, of course, there's so much more, like he said, there's so much more breakdown. We'll get to that, but let's just start here and asking ourselves questions and being reflective and being willing to explore an area that maybe you've put under lock and key. And you said, I can't touch this because that means I'm anti-women. No, you're not exploring who you are and exploring the questions that you have, especially when you feel like you're made for more and you know, you're made for more. And you have these questions of saying, can I have a more abundant life? You know, let's take the box out. Let's unlock whatever you have locked away and let's just pick it up and look at it, explore it. Because I think, you know, that can sound really abstract, but I think when you're listening, you know, and I, and I've had individuals say this to me too. It's like, I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're getting at. And these are the areas Mm -hmm. that I need to be willing to um, dig a little deeper. We can't be afraid to dig. We can't be afraid to ask questions. And that's something that, Oh, absolutely. Especially for something like this, like this is the space where I think it's really easy to run away. And, and this is the time to lean in. This is the time to lean in, follow the accounts online that, you know, I share this message and challenge you in, in seeing a different, a different light, a different way of what it looks like to live out being a woman. Absolutely. And I think it just ties into everything that you were saying of just like exploring, you know, if there's something tugging on your heart, like the the whole episode is really, you know, we were kind of like just really getting at that whole idea of, um, you know, get, having knowledge, being empowered with knowledge and, you know, a question, questions are the best thing that we can do is really question anything with our health, question anything that we're putting into our bodies and, you know, quest, just questioning and questions are the best thing, right? Like Jesus asked so many questions in the gospel. And so, for us as women to just keep questioning, 
what we're doing and being the, the more questions we ask, the more knowledge that we're going to get. And, um, and I think that's something that I would, you know, I would just highly encourage every w- woman to do. And, you know, Bridget has amazing resources and like things that we've talked about, like they're all great places to, to point us toward. And, um, and I think that's the hope. That's the hope to leave with women who are, you know, confused about feminism, confused about women's health, birth control, any of that. Um, that's kind of the hope there is that, those, like you said, those tugs, those questions are all, are all good things. That's so good, Alex. I'm so grateful to chat with you. I mean, I love chatting with you, I know, <laughs> me too. Podcast, but this is so good to have you on and just sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and just in this space where you're really, um, you're calling women on in such a beautiful and authentic way. And in a way of, of such love and really encouraging women in that space, because I think, man, we need more of it. We need, we, we need Alex. We need you listening. We need this space to be filled up with women who are courageous enough to, to speak in love and speak truth in love. So Alex, thank you so much for being on the show, for being here and sharing your knowledge. Your oh, thank expertise. you. It's been a joy to chat with you and have you. Oh, I thank you so much, Bridget. I love it. I love, I love telling everyone about managing your fertility. I love the work you're doing and I, it's, it's so needed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and help expand the conversation around women's health. If you'd like to learn more about fertility awareness, visit www.managingyourfertility.com for more information, resources, guides, and so much more.